This is a production of WTVI PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact, high school graduation rates continue to grow, but how do we help the nearly 15% who drop out each year? We'll take a look at a local program making a difference. Plus, we'll meet a man using soccer to motivate kids to excel on the field and in the classroom. And we'll hear from a local painter who lassos some of our favorite places to put them on canvas, which allows us to enjoy them at home. Don't go anywhere. Carolina Impact starts right now. WTBI PBS Charlotte presents Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Funding for Carolina Impact is provided by the members of WTVI PBS Charlotte and by... The Philip L. Van Every Foundation is pleased to support our region's arts organizations and artists with profiles and feature stories on Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. Graduation rates for the Charlotte Mecklenburg School District hit a new high last year, rising to 85.2%. This marks the fifth consecutive year the district has seen an increase. The district graduation rate actually beats the national average by about 4%. Carolina Impact's Daniel Koser shows us how one organization makes a difference to help keep kids in school. Kicking the ball and racing toward first base. Kids cheer each other on in a game of kickball. Between the fun and the games, leaders with the Salvation Army Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Charlotte say they work to teach kids life lessons, encouraging them to build character, continue their education, and live a healthy lifestyle. Part of the Boys and Girls Club's mission is to enable the young people who need them the most. That's why all of the Boys and Girls Clubs in Greater Charlotte are located within 100 yards of public housing, like here in North Charlotte's Dillahay Courts. At the Boys and Girls Club, I just knew that I wanted to do better because the environment that I live in, I live in public housing, and it's just like, I did not want to see myself in public housing ever again. <laughs> Shaquania Watson remembers when she lived here. Middle school, I hated it. Um, I didn't want to get up. My mom wasn't telling me to get up, so um, when I went to the Boys and Girls Club, it was just like, you know, they pushed me to go to school. Then we saw him step in on the mat. The organization Look, strives to help him. thousands of students like mat. Watson each year. Executive Director Marty Clary says 92% of the overall club population qualifies for the free and reduced meal program at school, and 67% of the families served make less than $25,000 annually. The population that we serve are primarily kids that are from difficult circumstances. It is well documented that, that poverty um, influences academic success or, or lack thereof. It can be a big factor. Data from the National Center for Education Statistics shows the dropout rate of students living in low-income families is greater than the dropout rate of students from middle or high-income families. Dana Carpenter, Director of Operations, says clubs offer several programs designed to help students graduate Many of them stress the importance of goal setting. It starts with our, our first graders who come into the homework program. They're going to set goals to get their homework done. They're going to set goals um, to move their grades forward. Well, there's a power hour that I like where we get to do our homework. Another program, Goals for Graduation, encourages students to commit to graduating from high school. Club leaders also take teens on college tours. It is so important to take our kids onto a campus it erases the fear of the unknown. I've always wanted to go to college, um, but the hard part was getting there. Um, I didn't know what to do to get there. Watson says she became the first member of her family to graduate from high school and go to college, pursuing a degree in entrepreneurship at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. She spends her summers back here in Charlotte working with kids. She didn't allow her situation to become her future. You know, she was able to take what was going on and use it for the betterment of her life. You know, she didn't use it as something, as an excuse not to, 
but she used it as a reason why she should. And that's what makes her story so great. Bernard Neal, a former member of the Boys and Girls Club, says he can relate to Watson's story. We lived in the project and there was always something bad to get into. The Boys and Girls Club kept us away from those things and gave us things to do that was very impactful and at the same time very meaningful. The Boys and Girls Club is a safe place for kids to come when they have nowhere else to go after school. Statistics released from the Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Charlotte show 94% of alumni say they graduated from high school, and nearly 40% say they received a college degree. Being at the Boys and Girls Club just made me realize that I did want to do something with my life. That's real heartwarming to me, even as an administrator, to see kids on a regular basis that the light switch all of a sudden comes on and they see, oh, I can be that. I can do that. Stories like Watson show just how far kids can go with some structure, encouragement, and guidance. But you would never know that these kids live some awful lives outside when you see them in the club because for that short moment of time, they're able to forget about all those things and truly enjoy being a child. Fun and games. And then that cat saw my dog. With a focus on education. Club leaders say they strive to help kids learn their value and form a vision for the future. For Carolina Impact, I'm Danielle Koser reporting. Thanks so much, Danielle. It's always great to see a program making a difference in our children. We want to learn a little bit more about programs making a difference in our schools, and I have a special guest joining me right now. We have Michelle King. She supervises all of the social workers in the Charlotte Mecklenburg School District. Michelle, thanks so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me today. You know, it is good to see and to hear that the graduation rates are getting better. Mm -hmm. Five years in a row. Talk to us about what do you think has made the biggest impact to get us moving in the right direction? You know, Amy, I think it's a variety of factors that um, are all coming together the way that we need them to be. We've got uh, some great initiatives going on in CMS to really ensure that our students are getting on target for graduation. One of those things is called the Graduation Success Initiative, and that's some really systematic work that our school counselors and other folks in the schools do to monitor students' transcripts and the courses they're taking to make sure that they're staying on track for graduation. So that's one of the big things. They're also doing a lot of strategic scheduling. So for some of our English language learning students and- How big of a population is that of your there's multiple different languages being spoken. Lots More of than just one. Many people think it's just Spanish Absolutely. speakers. Absolutely. We have uh, dozens of different languages spoken in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. And so uh, we have some really strategic efforts. We have a great international center as part of our district that works with those families when they're first coming into the district to get the students placed in the right um, grade level and at their schools. And uh, we just try to make sure that the classes that they're being put in are catered towards what their best needs are. And that's the case for our exceptional children as well. And as a large urban school district, you've got over 140,000 students, mm -hmm. yep, well over. 168 schools, mm -hmm. dozens of different languages. Right. It's not an easy job to do what you do, but That's you true. folks have really been focused on reading and success in reading. Mm -hmm. And one initiative the superintendent, Ann Clark, has been to get people reading on a third grade level mm -hmm. by the third grade. Right. But there's a new program about reading that we could, you could use the help of the community as well. Tell us about it. Absolutely. This program that we're, uh, Dr. Uh, Superintendent Clark has launched this year is called our North Star Reading Partners Initiative. And what she's asked is that every CMS employee takes on at least one student one hour a week, each week, to provide them with some direct mentoring and reading support. And we're looking at doing this with not only our third grade students, but also our seventh grade students and our seniors as well. And that's another thing that will certainly push them towards that last step, towards graduation. And what we're doing now is that's being expanded into the community as well. And so we are asking that any community members that want to help a child and help our kids reach that graduation uh, level of our, our goal for 90% by the end of this school year, can join us in doing that by just giving one hour a week to a student. We think it makes a really big difference. And what an exciting thing to go from a life, you know, there's so many business folks in our area who've seen success, but to take your life from being successful to a life of significance mm -hmm. by being able to help a young person graduate mm -hmm. on time. We're gonna put 
a link to your website on our website so folks can sign up and we hope That'd to help great. you drive. You know, hopefully thousands of folks will pay attention mm -hmm. tonight and want to make a difference in the lives of young people. That would be fantastic. What else do we need to see before we run out of time? You've got some creative learning strategies also that are in the works to continue to grow mm -hmm. the graduation rate. Right, so CMS has really made some efforts and continues to do so in offering kids some, uh, some creative strategies such as additional online learning opportunities. You know, not every student fits into the traditional model of instruction and education as we've known it for hundreds of years. So having opportunities like North Carolina Virtual Public School, um, doing some credit recovery through some online work and things of that nature. When we talk about credit recovery, what does that mean for this so person? So we're talking about kids who, uh, for whatever reason, are behind in credits or have failed courses, and therefore it's pushing them away from being on track to that graduation success and that college and career readiness that we're always aiming for. And so having these options in place can help them recover some of those credits and get them back on track to where they need to be. Because we found that when kids start to fall back and be off track, they get closer and closer to being at risk for dropping out of school. And our goal is to get them to graduate from school and be college and career ready. So that's going to help them do that. We want to congratulate you on the progress you've made so far and hope that the whole community can wrap around and be a part of the future success of all of our young people so we can have a beautiful, vibrant uh, area to enjoy for I, many years to come. I think that would be fantastic. And you know, we, I think we do an awesome job at CMS, but our kids are our community. They're our future and uh, we all take ownership of them. So as we continue to partner to do things like this, I think we can only see good things come from it. Michelle King from Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, thanks so much for your time, we appreciate it. Thank you for having me, I enjoyed it. Have you got your pet cuddled up beside you this evening? I have to show you a picture of my Maxie Mae. I've often called her my perfect child. No offense to my 14-year-old son, RJ. Our pets are important members of the family, and when they're not as playful and active as they used to be, we look hard for solutions. Anyone with a large dog knows hip dysplasia is one of the more common issues. A group of seventh graders at Providence Day School invented a unique hip brace designed to help. As Carolina Impact's Jeff Rivenbark explains, their hard work won them a spot in a national competition. The Makerspace is like a large playground for students to experiment, create, and invent new things. Having that, that high up. A 3D printer hums in the background while a group of middle school students huddle on the floor. We added this. A healthy golden retriever stands patiently while the students adjust a prototype hip brace tailored to the dog's frame. Earlier this year, the students were unable to settle on any idea for this year's e-cyber mission competition. Students have to find a real-world problem in their communities and create a solution using science, technology, engineering, and math. Science teacher Barbara Morrow had an idea. I had actually just come home from the vet. A gentle, that's a girl. Morrow's 14-year-old dog, Sandy, suffers from severe hip dysplasia, a disease of the hip in which the ball and socket is malformed, causing joints to rub and grind instead of sliding smoothly. Sandy has a hard time getting up or even going outside. I said to the students, wow, you know, I'd really like to see you guys do something with hip dysplasia in dogs. If you could somehow try to either minimize the effect that it has on the mobility of these large breed dogs or um, try to um, extend the life of these dogs. I felt bad for Sandy and I wanted to help her. I thought if we could do something to keep that from happening to another dog or so that, that Sandy would feel less pain and dogs like Sandy wouldn't have that same problem. As the students' interest grew, they started meeting at odd times during lunch or after school to share what they discovered about the disease as well as a possible solution. The medications that we frequently When the use. students realized a veterinarian can either scan or take an MRI image of a dog's hips, they came up with an idea to enter those measurements into a computer connected to a 3D printer and then print a piece of plastic customized to a dog's frame. This could then be inserted into a strap or brace around the dog's hips. We met three of the four students working on the project. The students with pets contacted their veterinarians to learn more. I would act more as a guide for them. Hey, this is what you need to learn. This is what you need to find out. And I would teach them little things along the way, maybe a little bit of anatomy here and there, but they were getting most of what they got, what they learned from each visit at the vet. Morrow's veterinarian, Dr. Marty Davis, says she was blown away by how much the students knew when they showed her their prototype. The kids were just amazing. They were so purposeful, they were so earnest, they were so excited. They had obviously put an enormous amount of thought and work into it. 
and they were working with a 3D printer, which honestly I know very little about, but they schooled me. As finalist in the 13th annual e-cyber mission competition, each of the four students won $4,000 and participated this summer in the national competition in Washington, D.C. I mean, I was a little surprised because there were a lot of students entering the competition and it was really cool to feel that all of us worked so hard and we got this far. That there must be a practical application with just about everything we do. Glenn Kalishal is the headmaster of Providence Day School. He says kids learn best when they can connect a learning concept with a real life problem. These four students will continue to have this passion for learning, but they will continue to look for design and research solutions which will not only serve them well in high school, will prepare them well for college, but prepare them for a world of work and design and research problem solving in that huge environment out there because the world is their oyster. I think probably the most rewarding thing as a teacher is seeing what the kids do outside of the classroom. So we can light little sparks inside the classroom, but then seeing them go outside the classroom and build the flame is probably the most rewarding thing as a teacher. While the students didn't win the national competition, they're proud of what they were able to do as a team. I guess it was pretty cool to know that we mostly designed the brace and reached out to the vets. And I thought it was cool that how four seventh grade kids were able to design a brace that would help dogs and the whole dog community. And if they could come up with a solution to a problem like this to help ailing dogs, who knows what they may be able to invent years from now. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jeff Rivenbark reporting. Thanks so much, Jeff. If you'd like to learn more about the Army's e-cyber mission competition, we have a link posted on our website at pbscharlotte.org. I also want to remind you about WTVI PBS Charlotte's third annual STEM competition. Please watch our website after the first of the year for details and deadlines. Last year, we recognized dozens of students and teachers throughout our region for excellence in science, technology, engineering, and math. If your high school students are working on projects right now that are STEM related, they should enter for a chance to be recognized in our spring competition. Well, sports often play a huge part in helping kids at school. We found a new soccer training academy on Charlotte's west side that's making a difference. The program provides an outlet for children from low-income homes to learn how to play soccer, study, and learn teamwork. Producer Rodney Myers shares more. I started the program because I saw by working in local uh, uh, organizations where kids need to pay uh, a lot of money to play the sport, I saw the needs of those kids that really couldn't uh, uh, afford to play, but they also wanted to do it and they didn't have that opportunity. So two years ago, I decided to create Creative Players Sports Foundation. I was born and raised in Montevideo, capital of Uruguay, South America, a small country down south in uh, South America. I had the opportunity to play soccer in my country in Uruguay. I always wanted to work with kids and, and that was my dream. What I think about the um, Creative Play program is that um, you get to have fun, um, it's all about teamwork. The most important is to learn life lessons. They do not live with their mom or their dad together. Some of them live just with their mom, some of them just with their dad, some of them without even any member of the family. They do what they love, which is play soccer. But they also are in an environment that we use the soccer ball as a tool of education. When first I had like C's and D's, I, I was not that like, the, I was not that up. But then when I got to the A's and B's, I got, I got more, ex I got more happy because I'm, I improved. We got three different uh, uh, methodology of training and playing. You have an outer field, artificial turf, that we build just with the regular rules of soccer. Then you have this indoor facility that the ball never goes outside. It's great for fitness because the ball is always in place. And then we have what we're the only ones in Charlotte that build this place. It's a beach soccer court. It's a small soccer arena that we mainly do with the kids uh, physical uh, fitness training. Over there the kids go and imagine that they're in the sand, jumping, running, sprinting, explosion, but they also play. The most fun part is where you like, where you like get into the game and like people start passing. I would like to see this program establish a consistent 
training environment going from three days a week to six days a week. That's what I'm looking for. I think that the process of learning and reaching more kids will give us the, the possibility and opportunity to give them the opportunity they're looking for. And we're looking for partners to help us keep these programs alive so we can have over here a full training program from Monday to Saturday. If you practice, um, you'll like be good at something. That's how you're special. You can learn more about Creative Player on our website at pbscharlotte.org. Finally tonight, an artist with an amazing story. When David French moved to Charlotte 21 years ago, he planned to pursue a degree in engineering. But he soon realized his passion was elsewhere. He signed up for art classes at Central Piedmont Community College, and when he started feeling a bit more confident with his painting, he quit his full-time job in 2008, and he's been doing art ever since. Producer Rodney Myers is back again with the details. I've chosen to go the other route. My unofficial motto is art for the people, and, and it's worked out for me. The more I've created my, my paintings, the more I've tried to listen to what people want, and uh, the more I've tried to give the public what they want, and that has in turn created what I am doing. I had moved to NODA, and I was being mentored at this time by a professional mural painter, Star Davis. I moved into the Red House behind the Smelly Cat and opened a Friday night only gallery out of the back of my house. Um, but I, I went and took Design One to finish up my associate's degree. That's when Elizabeth Spotswood Alexander uh, told me to go paint whatever I want, and that's when I painted the painting of the Athens restaurant that kickstarted my Charlotte uh, painting career. Now, what I was going to do, I was going to go look for another job slowly. I worked out those $2,000 with the commissions and just found ways and ways and many, many blessings later, I'm still self-employed. I haven't had a job since then. I'm 200 something paintings in the Charlotte now. There's a very short list of what I haven't painted that are in people's hearts. Number one is the Whitewater Center. High top of my list. That's what's in front of me right now. These days I do most of my work here in the studio using photographs. I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna lay the thing out with the grid system, the one-to-one -one grid system, which is great when you can do one-to-one. -one. Then you don't have to do any math. The truth is, is that you could paint the most incredible painting in the world and if no one knew to find you, then your painting will drift off into obscurity. Uh, you have to find a way to get into the public's eye. I think I'm Charlotte's number one expert on what people love about Charlotte. I do 20 events and talk to thousands of people a day. They, they are coming in my booth, they are coming in my studio, they are asking me, do you have this place, do you have that place? As I ask people what to do with my paintings sometimes, I uh, also run contests on Facebook and so forth, asking people to name my paintings. When I finish a painting, I'll often ask people, if you, if you come up with the best name, I'd love to give you a print of the painting. The number one example, I did a painting of the Charlotte Knights baseball stadium with Skyline behind it, and someone came up with a Midsummer's Night's Dream, which I thought that, that was really great. You can find David French's prints in stores all across Charlotte, including Paper Skyscraper on East Boulevard, Ruby's Gifts in Noda, and Green with Envy in Plaza Midwood. We've also got a link to his website at pbscharlotte.org. Well, do you have a suggestion for a story idea you'd like to see on an upcoming Carolina Impact? We'd love to hear from you. The best way to let us know all about them and the details are by sending us an email to carolinaimpact at wtvi.org. Right now I'd like to congratulate Maggie Parson McBee from Gastonia. She just won another family four pack of tickets to the Carolina Renaissance Festival. How'd she do it? Well, she friended us on Facebook and you could be our next winner. Please give us a like. We've got more four packs to the Renaissance Festival to give away yet this month. So we'd absolutely love it if you'd friend us there. Well, that's all we have time for this week. From all of us here at WTVI PBS Charlotte, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate your time and hope to see you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. Funding for Carolina Impact is provided by the members of WTVI PBS Charlotte and by... The Philip L. Van Every Foundation is pleased to support our region's arts organizations and artists with profiles and feature stories on Carolina Impact.
a production of WTBI-PBS Charlotte.